Welcome uh, today to the last session of the day. Uh, the session today will be about financing protection of natural forests. Um, and I want to start with introducing the fantastic panel of the day. Um, and in order of appearance, we have Evelyn Trines, and she works at Tropenbos uh, International as a tropical forester and a business and finance expert as well. Then uh, we have uh, Evan Sampene joining us virtually, and he's from Tropenbos Ghana, and he works there as a pro project coordinator. Um, and on my right hand, for you on uh, my left, we have Alejandro Vasquez, who is the fund manager of, amongst others, the Forestry and Climate Change Fund. Um, my name is Sharissa Bosma. I work for FMO um, on the topic of climate uh, adaptation. And I'm also doing a PhD at Wageningen University on land use and climate change in sub-Saharan Africa. And I would also like to thank Michael de Groot from, from Rabobank Development, who has put a lot of effort into organizing this session. So thank you for that. Um, um, then I would like to just start by... Um, by briefly setting the scene before we go into the, into the presentations. Um, and I think a few of you have been uh, at the previous session, which was about climate finance. And here on this slide, it's a, it's a very little um, um, a figure from my PhD research, but I just want to highlight, I'm not going into all the details, but I just want to highlight that climate change and land use change are very interconnected. Um, Conserving natural uh, ecosystems is essential for a number of reasons. And as you can see here on this fig figure that I think to start with, ecosystems play a very large role in global carbon cycles. Um, forests, for example, are extremely important because they sequester a significant amount of carbon. Um, and at the same time, ecosystem degradation and land use change um, can have uh, can come with a lot of greenhouse gas emissions that are very harmful for the planet. But secondly, natural ecosystems also provide a wide natural ecosystems provide a wide range of um, ecosystem services that go from food uh, to um, water as well, but also flood control and uh, maintenance of rainfall patterns. Um, and just, just to set the scene, um, despite the importance of natural ecosystems, deforestation and uh, ecosystem degradation are widespread. And agricultural expansion is one of, the, one of the largest causes of deforestation. At the same time, smallholders and family farms occupy uh, an estimated 70 to 80 percent of uh, global farmland. And they produce together uh, a significant amount, an estimated 80% of the world's food. And from this, we take that locally owned sustainable land use solutions are of paramount importance. However, um, a lot of money is invested. We have an estimated 73 billion US dollars being invested into, into food, into food value change. But very little of this actually reaches the, farm, the smallholder farmers and the uh, family farms that produce a large amount of the food. So in this session, um, uh, we will be discussing how can we reduce conflict over land and ensure that investments reach this grassroots level. And the program of today will um, first have three separate presentations. The first one will be from Tropenbos. Then um, the Forestry and Climate Change Fund will give a presentation followed by my presentation about the Dutch Fund for Climate and Development. And we will end with a hopefully interactive discussion and a Q&A uh, with the audience, both um, the audience here, but also the online audience is, uh, is asked to ask questions if, uh, if you want to. Um, without further ado, um, Evelyn and Evans, you, uh, you can take the floor. And I will bring up your presentation. Yeah, thank you, Teresa. Um, great to see so many people in the room. We realize that we are between uh, you and, uh, and the drinks at the reception, so we'll try to make it uh, uh, as interesting as possible. 
Uh, I'll do a couple of slides and then uh, turn over to my colleague uh, who is in Ghana, who is uh, running a pilot there. Um, Tropenbos is operational in 10 countries that you see depicted here. Some are uh, true Tropenbos offices, other, other ones are network partners. We are working in f what we call frontier landscapes, landscapes where forests are at threat, uh, mainly of agro-commodities sort of creeping into these, uh, these frontiers. Uh, we focus on landscape level solutions, so not individual activities. Individual activities can be sustainable, but if you portray them in a landscape together with lots of other activities, it might not be sustainable. Uh, we do that for the local people and the global community, trying to connect the grassroots level with the international uh, global challenges that we're facing. And we're trying to balance the needs of all these stakeholders. So a couple of things on this slide, lots of uh, text, but uh, Charissa already said quite a bit of it. 70% uh, of global deforestation is caused by agriculture, mainly by agro-commodities -commod taking more and more space. Um, at the same time, it causes 30% of climate change, uh, forest degradation, deforestation. And uh, we are also in the UN decade of family farming, you might not know. But uh, the biggest part of farmland is occupied by family farms and they, for instance, produce cocoa, which then goes to the bigger international value chain uh, players. Uh, but together they produce more than 80% of the world food. There are some references there where you can check whether this is indeed the case. There's 570 million family farms worldwide. Over 500 million farms have less than two hectares and over 410 million have less than one hectare. So we're really dealing with smallholders. And the last comment in the previous session from the gentleman from GIZ was very much about uh, how you deal with uh, the reaching those people at the grassroots level if there are such small players. So we believe at Tropenbos that integrating food production and forest conservation is the way to go. Um, we're trying to, to experiment with ways of, of financing um, smallholder practices, a lot through aggregation. Uh, um, and if you look at agroforestry, we've done indicative cost-benefit analysis. You can see that if you look at a, an agroforestry system, so trees together with food crops and other crops, your return on an investment per hectare can go to a five-fold, six-fold. So financially, it's interesting as well, aside from all the um, environmental and, and uh, other benefits uh, that it has. So um, our Ghana, Ghana experience, uh, Evans, are you there? Evans, hello, hello. Earth calling Evans. Okay, let me just carry on. Hopefully he will uh, join us in any minute now. Uh, so we are working on the landscape level, um, identifying key landscapes challenges, and then we do calls for business proposals uh, that address at least one of these key challenges. Uh, we've got business panel panels uh, consisting of experts who then look at the business cases um, the most successful ones, the most promising ones, we take into... Uh, Hello, uh, Evelyn. Hi, Evans. There you are. You want to take over? Yes, sorry. Good. My, yes, I want to take over. No my, worry, go, my, my go ahead. My mic was closed. That's why I couldn't... Yes. So, um, I will continue from where you left off. Um, in Ghana, we are implementing a program called Mobilizing More for Climate, funded by the Dutch government. And uh, we are implementing it in the cocoa landscape of Ghana, where we are trying to bring up business cases uh, up to the point of investment ready and then making them bankable. So our approach uh, to the business case development has been the integrated landscape approach where we use the multi-stakeholder platform within the landscape to identify uh, some key landscape challenges. So these uh, key landscape challenges uh, relate to uh, cocoa-driven deforestation, uh, 
the issue of over over reliance on cocoa production, uh, the issue of uh, under development of uh, production value chains, and then the issue of uh, climate change impact on smallholder farmers' livelihood, and then the issue of uh, lack of diversification uh, within the landscape. Uh, please, if the host can make the presentation a bit bigger, I can't see it very well. So we try to organize the business cases around these key landscape challenges. Uh, we do this together with an expert panel where we ask people within the landscape to submit their business proposals. After that, we sit down with the expert panel to look at all the proposals we receive. Uh, we have a set of criteria we've developed to assess the business proposals, and then we try to select the most promising uh, business cases. Uh, after that, we try to support them with capacity building, uh, which is very important and key to this particular uh, program. We try to support them to develop their business cases by first using the business canvas to understand their business itself. We support them with a lot of capacity building in terms of financial literacy, business management trainings, uh, dealing with the bank, and then managing credit. These are some of the uh, uh, capacity building we try to support them with. But notwithstanding this, there are some challenges uh, we continue to experience. Uh, and one of the most challenges has been the perceived risks of these uh, small and medium forest enterprises. The risk could be in two folds. Rex uh, from the financial service providers part and then Rex from the receivers, that is the business case proponents part. But these risks are mostly uh, due to natural situation such as weather conditions, disease and pests, and then the credit worthiness of these uh, small businesses. It's really a challenge uh, for them the other issue is with the small nature of these uh, business cases. Most of them are at uh, uh, a medium to uh, small scale and not well developed. So that's, in that case, we need to bring them up to speed. We need to let them understand their business operation, give them the technical know-how. So that is uh, a challenge. Uh, we are facing. There is also the challenge of uh, them not uh, getting, having the collateral in terms of uh, uh, what the guarantees they need in order to be able to assess finance. It's also uh, a challenge. Uh, the other challenge is also the technical know-how. They lack uh, capacity in uh, financial literacy business case development, uh, managing credits. In fact, most of them, uh, they, they don't have any experience dealing with the financial sector. They, 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 they have been excluded from the financial sector and that, that is a bigger challenge. So we need to introduce them, uh, bring them up to speed as far as financial inclusions are concerned. So for us, Tropenbos, uh, we are supporting these small business cases to bring them up to that speed. And uh, there is also the issue of uh, not being able to pilot, to get proof of concept. They need financial resources to be able to pilot their promising business cases so that we can get good results and then showcase. So that has also been one of our major uh, challenge. Uh, there are some solutions we are already uh, proposing or discussing as far as the implementation of our program is concerned. Uh, we are trying to support the aggregation of these 
small holder business cases, bringing a number of them together, especially cooperatives, and then uh, supporting them with capacity building, and then giving them the needed support and strength to be able to aggregate to become a bigger uh, business cases. Uh, we are also talking to banks within the landscape to see how we can come together to develop uh, a financing mechanism to support uh, these uh, business cases. So we are looking at guarantees, we are looking at uh, blended finance, and then we are looking at uh, all the possible options we can put on the table. Not just that, but we are also developing their capacities and then trying to bring them to the point where they can be become bankable and then they, they can become investment uh, readiness. So for the past uh, two and a half years, this is what uh, we've been doing within the cocoa landscape in Ghana. Thank you very much, and Evelyn will continue. Thanks, Evans. That was loud and clear. Thank you. Just for those of you who are not really familiar with agroforestry system, this is a, in a cocoa-dominated uh, landscape. You see the cocoa trees, but at the same time, you see cassava, you see plantain, you see ginger. So there's lots of food crops in here as well, who then traditionally go to the local markets. Um, can I see the slides, please? Thank you. Um, so the, um, I've already mentioned a couple of the, uh, of the upsides of agroforestry. For the sake of time, I'll, uh, I'll skip most of them. Uh, the higher return on investment I had already uh, mentioned, but also the, the global challenges here, climate change, more agrobiodiversity, and of course the support for family farms. Um, the, the trial that we're doing with the financial uh, mechanism uh, is based on the Rural Enterprise Project that has been running in Ghana since, I believe, 2012. Some 50 million US dollar has gone through that system, uh, and we've been picking that up and using it now for discussions with the local banks. Uh, under the Rural Enterprise Project, they established the Rural Enterprise Development Fund, uh, and that's uh, um, basically a blend of technical assistance, guarantees, and a revolving fund. And I'll try to uh, explain that here. I think there's a pointer in here, is there? Let me see. No, okay, I'll, I'll do it like this. So the idea is that uh, the business cases are being supported by Tropenbos Ghana with technical assistance before the business cases are selected, they go through a, a pro, uh, approval process. Um, Tropenbos International is supporting Tropenbos Ghana financially and in terms of capacity as well if needed. Uh, but Tropenbos Ghana has set up meetings with uh, a selection of local rural banks and we did a tour in June to invite them to respond to this template and look at, uh, to basically assess their appetite, whether they were interested in participating in this trial of us. And the idea is that you uh, make the ticket size available through the bank, but the bank itself only puts up a small percentage of the money. So their risk is pretty small. And from the Tropenbos side, we have uh, received a, a, a grant that we can use to put the rest of the money basically on the table. So 80% of the money is being made available by us, by the, by the Green Finance for SME facility, but we cap the interest rate because the interest rates in Ghana, they can go up to 50%, it's really terrible. Uh, we kept the interest rate in this particular case at 12.5%. Um, the bank can, on the 20% on the part of the ticket size, they then, of course, have a, a bigger chunk of interest that they can uh, add, the 9%. We loan the money to the bank for, th for 3.5%. Um, and basically, the, it's, an, it's an on loaning, on, onward loan system whereby our money goes through the bank to the borrower. Um, the interest rate, as I said, is kept at 12.5%, and the bank does everything as normal, the onboarding, uh, making sure that the 
um, uh, those who want to borrow the money can act are actually credit worthy, etc. Uh, and then the money comes back to the fund uh, against a 3.5% uh, interest rate on the 80% of the ticket size that we prov provide to the bank. So that is the, the structure that we're now using. Uh, the money comes back with a little bit of interest and we can put it out on the table again for business cases. The business cases are selected, as Evans explained, against the key landscape challenges. So in that way, we try to build a, a, a more sustainable landscape whilst providing uh, access to finance for, for the smallholders. So that's the, the system, uh, basically. So um, Michael asked us, why are you coming to the session here? And I said, well, I'm really interested to learn from all of you, mainly um, microfinance institutions and, and larger development banks, etc. Do you have experience with that? And can you teach us anything? What's your response to this kind of uh, model? But I'll hand it back to you then, uh, Charissa. Thank you. Great, thank you. All right, then I'm going to hand over to the next presentation, Alejandro. I'll put up the slides. Perfect. Yes, so first, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here and representing Investing for Development. Um, usually people know us as more for our microfinance fund, uh, Luxembourg, Luxembourgish Microfinance Development Fund. Today I'm going to speak more about the other fund we have, which is the Forestry Climate Change Fund. Um, it's a fund that we started working on, on it uh, from, from the initiative in October 2015. Uh, and as you can see, actually, one, one of the things that is important to see is that it took a lot of time to really uh, come to in, into a concept to really identify what are the objectives of the fund, how it's going to be operating, which geographic areas we, are, we were going to target. Uh, so the fund was actually this, uh, then launched in October 2017, but most of this work was really supported to technical assistance and really doing um, a lot of work with CATI, which is an institution in, in, in uh, Latin America. And it was identified that the fund was going to really focus on Central America. And I will go more in, det in detail why, but it, we identified that it's very important to really understand the grassroots of, of the financing we are doing. Uh, you know, because the challenge as well is when we want to go to the communities or the local forest areas, we really need to get the full grasp uh, of of the environment they are they are facing and where they are situated. And so, basically, the fund is really focused on um, uh, the regeneration of the f uh, secondary forest or degraded forest. So it was identified, and I think I'm not going to enter into much detail about these figures, but most of the most of the tropical forest or big part of the tro tropical forest are degraded or secondary forests. And this is ha this, these forests have a lot of value uh, in terms of the opportunity to actually come and recover and become a primary forest. Um, so basically our fund is looking at this type of, this type of forest, uh, looking at forests that are either degraded or secondary um, and uh, really work on it and have a project, long-term project, to, to, to help them regenerate into a primary uh, forest. Uh, so everything is all about our theory of change. We fixed out what are the different goals we want to get, and uh, so this is basically our theory of change from, from the three axes, um, main axes we have. So one is the natural capital. So again, we're looking at the forest, and how the forest has, is going to regenerate and how it's going to really um, create, uh, we will end up with a more, uh, a more developed forest. The second is the value chain, because we identify as well, uh, and I'm sure uh, people in this, in this auditorium will, will, will confirm that there's a big difference, a big space between uh, the, the forest, 
and actually going into the market and, 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 and selling a final product. So the value chain, uh, it, it's a key fundamental part of, of, uh, of the projects we are, we are working on. And it requires financing. It requires financing to really develop these value chain um, companies to really be able to develop the products that then can go to the market and make sustainable uh, the secondary forest um, um, the secondary forest projects. One thing that's well is important to mention is that uh, rain, uh, these secondary forests are doesn't necessarily have all these common species like uh, they are known in the market, uh, mahogany. Uh, all the, the, the common, the common uh, species. So one of the targets as well is for us to, when we see the project, is how, how we are going to support that not, not very well-known species are actually find a place in the market. Because if you find a place in the market for this secondary species or as, as for this uh, other species, then you make uh, a very sustainable project uh, for the long run. Um, and finally, obviously, as well, we look at a lot about the social uh, uh, aspect of the investment. So we look at fair sourcing policies, a proper uh, split of margin, uh, generation of employment, and really work with the communities. Uh, so we have, we have certain uh, projects where we work directly with the communities. So we follow the FPIC uh, guidelines to really ensure that there, there's a proper consent from the community to enter into the project. So again, just going back a little bit and saying, well, how, where, are, where are we going to intervene or what type of projects we are going to look at? We, we basically look at the cycle of the, of the, of the tropical forest. And from, from, a, from a tropical forest who has been uh, degraded or being overexploded or as, as, as it was said before, most of the challenges of the tropical forest is actually they're being removed because they're putting agriculture or other type of activities because they don't see the value for the forest. So in the cycle, we see that uh, we identify there are two types, of, two types of projects we can work on uh, and invest. The first one is the projects where there's already some level of, of trees, let's say the, 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 the forest is not completely uh, um, degraded. So you can build a business model based on the sustainable production of timber, which is basically you manage the forest, you ensure that the forest is, is, is growing and is maintained and, 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 and you are not over exploding, but at the same time you extract the economic value from the timber that you have. And this, well, I was saying before, the value chain aspect is very important because then you generate um, customer-ended products. The second, the second type of projects when we identify is when you go to an area, you identify there's going to be, for example, 10,000 hectares, but from those 10,000 hectares, you will have different, different forests inside the forest area. So you will have forests that are uh, in a certain state, okay, have some timber and you can you can use that timber to, to, sustain, uh, to sustain them, but there are areas where have been impacted by fire, there has been a hurricane, or there they had been agriculture pasture there, and basically th there's nothing you can do. And we identify that if you want to make an economical uh, project, you need to as well integrate the carbon credits. So, so we look as well at saying monetize, monetizing the carbon credits that you can generate from those forests, because obviously these forests are going to grow very fast. They are going to capture a lot of, uh, a lot of carbon, and it's a way you can actually monetize that opportunity. So basically, in our fund, we have two types of projects. The projects where are focusing on taking the, the, the carbon credits approach, let's say, the business model where you, where you start from a very degraded forest, but you build it into a sustainable productive forest. And you, you, you move from carbon, purely carbon credits uh, revenues, if I would say, into a, into a more sustainable um, uh, forest. But obviously all this is, imp all this is done 
based on having active sustainable forest management. And that is as well a key for, for the success because um, uh, part of the programs that we put in place and we follow very closely is how the forests are going to be managed. What are the practices that are going to be developed? What are the guidelines for, for, uh, for uh, managing those forests? So we have to identify as well local actors. I think someone in the previous session was saying, well, there's a lot of challenge how you do that. You have to identify local actors who know about forest management, who can do this in a, in a aligned with the vision of, of the phone or what you're trying to, to achieve, but at the same time, have this local relationship and the trust, because when you are speaking or when you are working with a community, you need to have their trust, and they need to really trust, because you are speaking here about uh, 15, 20 years projects where the, the, the assets they have, the, the, the forest they have, it's one of their main sources of, 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 of survival. So they have to really trust for the people who's, who's uh, participating in this project to manage their forest and go, uh, and go to that um, to, to make that project uh, uh, successful. So here, basically, I, I just tr try to summarize um, in, in one slide the, the different aspects that uh, we, we have to follow to really make that investments uh, reliable. One, it is basically a technical assistance part, which I think is something that uh, as well, uh, Evelyn mentioned before, it's it's a key part to have uh, these technical assistance on the ground. Uh, at the same time, uh, we have all the service providers, the service providers who are the people who know how to manage the forest, who who have the expertise on on value chain management, who have the expertise in 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 transforming the wood, and obviously as well, you have the community. And, and uh, a, a key challenge as well is that we have identified is the connection with the market. Yeah. Because, because you can have a very, very uh, good business plans, but at the end of the day, the connection with the market, the sale of the timber products in the market is basically what is going to drive the sustainability of the project. So here I'm just uh, showing uh, a slide where we, we show how we actually perform the investments. And we have two types of, 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 of ventures, or two types of, of looking at the project. One is basically looking at the project on the, a, a more mature project, where we have already some people, some local, uh, local project working on, on, uh, uh, on the forest, or, or basically they have their own business plan and they are looking for some financing. So they are approaching us, saying, well, we have this, pro this program, this project, we, we, we would like to have some type of financing. So we will look at the project, look at the feasibility, see, see how, how the project is, is, is performing. The other option is uh, looking into a venture capital approach. What we call is basically, we, l we do a, 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 a very short, term uh, assessment of the project, and then we decide to enter with them, go with them at the same time, uh, 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 do relatively small ticket sizes of investment, but actually looking at how then we can develop together the business plan and identify the different avenues for, for, for the project. Um, so I want to find, uh, to, to, to end my presentation as well, showing the type of financial instruments that we offer. Um, because even if, even if we historically have been a debt fi uh, investor, we really offer as well the equity portion of the, of the investment because we, we really we believe that, that um, uh, these projects require uh, as well some certain level of equity investment because we are speaking about startup, sometimes our startup companies or venture capital projects. Um, then we offer as well uh, value chain uh, um, instruments, basically capex instruments. We, we will as well offer working capital debt or even, as I was mentioning, uh, community, community, de community dedicated loans, right? So, 
with this the, with this offering, we we are able to to, to develop or tackle some of the challenges that these local uh, local projects have and local communities have, because obviously they have uh, difficulties to really approach and and have this financing. Um, have this fine access to these financing opportunities. So I will stop there. So, um, is it? Yeah, it's working. Um, we're moving to the last presentation of the day, so uh, bear with me. After that, we'll have a bit of interaction uh, in, ter in terms of a discussion. Uh, I hope you're all still uh, still awake. Um, so I will be uh, telling a bit about the Dutch Fund for Climate and Development, which is an FMO-managed uh, fund um, um, that we are managing on behalf of the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. The fund is um, about climate adaptation. That's the main, uh, the main goal of the fund. And just a very brief reminder, climate adaptation is the process of adjusting to the actual or the expected impact of climate change. Um, and the, the Dutch Fund for Climate and Development focuses very broadly on uh, two, um, uh, two types of ecosystems, or maybe three. One is land-based ecosystems. We uh, invest in forestry, we invest in food, and in land ecosystems, uh, more of a general, um, uh, general uh, environmental protection of those ecosystems. And on the other side of the spectrum, we focus on water. Um, these are ocean ecosystems, but also sanitation and freshwater ecosystems. Um, a lot of information on the slide, I won't go through all of it, but I think what is important here is that uh, the Dutch Fund of Cl for Climate and Development is a consortium. Um, we cooperate with our partners, SNV, uh, Climate Fund Managers and WWF. Uh, we have therefore also a very wide range of instruments available from grants, technical assistance, debt, equity um, and also mezzanine finance. And uh, as I mentioned already before, our donor is the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, I think for now only the bottom part of the, of the slide is relevant, the colorful part. Um, and I want to just briefly highlight that we have three facilities and the reason I'm saying this is because it's important for what will come after for just understanding how the fund works. We have an origination facility that is run by the two NGOs, WWF and SNV. And we have two investment facilities. So there's one uh, that's managed by FMO and there's one that's managed by climate fund managers. Um, and I think this and the next slide will explain a bit more how we cooperate. This is a relatively um, normal finance or project life cycle where on the top left you see the, the, the very early stage in which a company may, or a future company may find itself, starting with ideas, discovery, um, and that's usually, that part of the, of the life cycle is usually funded by traditional NGOs, very much grant-based. Um, once an idea seems viable, it moves to project development phase. And then afterwards it should go to piloting, and then afterwards commercialization and scaling. But what we see happening in practice very often is that the first part is covered. There are some NGOs that, that, that provide grants, um, usually for a, a given amount of time. But then there is the, what we call the valley of death. Projects do not graduate to a next phase. So what the, the Dutch Fund for Climate and Development is trying to do in the partnership between the investment investors and the NGO is, um, is stated here. Um, the best way to explain it, I think, is that both sides are trying to bridge the gap and, and turn the, the, the valley of death into the valley of opportunities. Um, and that means that there needs to be a move on both sides of the spectrum. So here with the DFCD, FMO, and also our, uh, our other invest, investment partner, climate fund managers, are trying to move a bit to the, what we would call the more risky type of investment by providing a form of certain forms of concessional finance. 
But at the same time, we are working with our, our NGO partners, WWF and SNV, to try to make the, um, the early stage projects bankable. And it's a very interesting process in which we try to cooperate, move together and bridge this gap. Um, so, so that in the end, hopefully a project will be able, be, will be financeable by other DFIs, FMO potentially, or even private investors. Um, so that's one. The second um, uh, thing that I would like to explain about the Dutch Fund for Climate and Development is its landscape approach. Um, a landscape approach, we have a definition here. It's a, it's a way of managing a landscape uh, by long-term cooperation, which is needed in landscapes, um, between multiple stakeholders with the purpose of achieving sustainable landscapes. Um, what do I mean by that? I intend to give you a very relatively concrete example here um, of a landscape in Zambia, the Cafio Flats. Um, it's a landscape where WWF has been active already in the past. And this just gives a bit of an overview of how we can cooperate with diff different types of parties and how we can join forces in a certain landscape. As you can see, there are certain type of projects in a bigger landscape, in this case, uh, for instance, about restoring a national park. Well, that's something that WWF is good at. Very much a grant-based activity probably will never become bankable, but that's part of a landscape and that's part of something that WWF in this case can do. Um, there are also other opportunities like the, the 2 million fish processing plant. That's something that WWF could work on, try to make bankable and investable for uh, parties like FMO. Um, and then there are the more, uh, I think, the more uh, standard uh, uh, investments that are already invest investable for uh, investors. But this is the way that we intend to cooperate in a landscape uh, as such. Um, just very briefly, a slide on where we're active. I think, um, as you can see, it's, uh, we are able to invest uh, almost everywhere in the global south. And there are a number of projects uh, happening already, as you can see. Um, and then maybe we've heard a lot about agroforestry already, so I won't go into all the benefits because I think, uh, I think both of you have, uh, have told a very interesting story already. But this is one of our actual investments uh, that the DFCD has invested in um, uh, recently. Uh, the company is called Comasa. And Comasa is a smallholder forestry uh, model. Um, in which the company uh, supports uh, uh, smallholders in Kenya um, to plant trees and thereby generate an additional uh, source of income, additional livelihood, um, as well as um, uh, regenerating their soils. And it provides, the, it provides the, the smallholder farmers with additional income and not only additional but also a long-term source of income. Um, and I think that is it. Uh, the floor is all yours. I would like to open up the floor to anyone who has a question, a comment. And as Evelyn said already, we would be very happy to hear also about your own experiences. Maybe people have similar models uh, or suggestions. So please feel free to... Uh, I th yes, this works. Thanks for the presentation. Um, also looking at the previous section of, uh, sorry, session of finding suitable investments. I noticed in your slides with a lot of information that the investments needed to be made in 2022, the 160 yeah. million. Did it work out and, and how was it to find the uh, suitable um, investments? I think it's a very good question. Um, the mandate indeed of investment was a four year period. So in 2022 it ends. Um, we have uh, managed to do uh, to, 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 to use all the money, uh, largely. Um, the year is not, uh, not finalized, of course. Um, I think there are definitely enough opportunities, but this is also um, a limited pot of money, and ideally we would grow these type of investments. Ideally, we, it wouldn't be 160 million, but it would be in the billions. Um, and then I think there need to be enough investable projects. And I think 
that is definitely a challenge for, for FMO, for investors. I think sometimes the projects that we are able to invest in are not there to a sufficient, uh, to in a sufficient scale, sufficient amounts. Um, and that's a challenge, and that's actually one of the reasons that we have this graduation approach, whereby we seek partners, because I think partnerships are crucial. I think investors like FMO need other partners on the ground who know and can develop projects. Um, and I think that's sort of where a lot can be gained still, and um, that's what we have tried to initially pilot with this first phase of the, the Dutch Fund for Climate and Development. Thanks for that. It's really interesting. Um, I'm interested in how you measure the performance of the funds. So obviously, adaptation resilience much harder to quantify than than uh, mitigation. Um, is the performance of the fund solely on kind of the financial performance of the investees and the amount that graduate onto FMO and others, or are you also measuring the kind of environmental and uh, adaptation impacts? Very good question, and um, yes, we measure whether a project is climate adaptation. We use the Rio markers for that. Um, I think most governments do. So that's the first start. After that, we have a certain set of indicators with which we try to measure that, but it's a work in progress. I think climate adaptation is very challenging to measure, and we are part of, uh, we're part of a working group, for instance, now to develop better indicators because it's it's extremely challenging to measure yeah um, I'm just very curious uh, uh, in line with the second speaker um, uh, if there is a certain kind of forest that uh, you prefer to fund because right now in the Philippines there are a lot of talks about uh, building bamboo forests and I wonder if that's uh, that's a that's one thing that you're interested in to, to find, if ever. Yeah, well, um, in, in our case, in the fund, we look at, uh, I didn't mention, and I apologize for that, we look as well at biodiversity. And it's part as well as some of the things we want to, to, to um, basically to, to look at. So anything that is related to plantations, if I understand, uh, understand your question, if it's something related to a, a, a forest that has been based on plantation or, or something like this, which is there's no biodiversity and it's not really looking at the recovering the original state of the forest, it is something that we will be reluctant to, to look at. Obviously, uh, the, 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 if the project is basically starting from that and become looking into become a, a, a a forest that is completely recovered, that will be something, a very interesting project for us because it's basically, we're speaking about regeneration from, from a current state where you have very low biodiversity to a, to, a, to a very more productive forest at the end. So, so just to, to, to look at, I don't know if I get, was that the question about, uh, did, I, did I answer your question? Thank you to all for the presentations. It was really very, very specific and very interesting to see also the financial products that we need to go into the forestry and agroforestry um, sectors. Specific interest ADA will, will work on in the next uh, months, I would say. My question would go to Evelyn a bit about the setup. You have managed to bring a product that is adapted to the needs of the local uh, partners. And um, so what, for how long can you, will you manage this product and how do you see the long-term, mid-long-term development of these products? Now you have done a quite intelligent and sophisticated setup um, and will you scale it to other areas where Truppenboss is, is active? Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, nice question. Yeah, we're doing, trialing different things uh, in different parts of the world. Uh, for instance, in Indo Indonesia, we do a marketing and trading uh, cooperative, uh, providing seed funds for, for them so they can buy rubber from the smallholders and then sell it onto the factory with a little plus there. So the fund becomes, stands on its own leg uh, at some stage. And the same 
in, um, in, in Ghana, where we try to have this financial mechanism in place, uh, after which it can stand on its own leg. Uh, we don't want to do a, a one-off thing and then see it disappear over time. Um, of course, uh, if it would be successful, but I would really be interested to hear your responses to, to the design, um, then also other investors can participate in a, in a credit line like that or revolving fund. Uh, but as Charissa was saying, finding good projects is sometimes a bigger challenge than finding money to finance it. But is, is that an answer to your question, more or less? Yes. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's, everything was very interesting and I have so many questions, so I will just try to choose one. <laughs> uh, it's for you, Alejandro. How sensitive is the business model to the fluctuation of the carbon market price, actually? Is it a, is it a big component? And, and just a second point uh, about the similar experience in Ivory Coast. I heard about something that is going now on uh, in Ivory Coast on Cocoa, similar model of uh, agroforestry transition. Um, the, there are challenges, but I think maybe but we can discuss it uh, later on. Thank you. So you, your question is about uh, um, how, how sensitive is the business models when we look at them to, to market, to, to current market state. I think uh, we look at projects in a very long run. Uh, so here we are looking at projects where more 15, 20, 30 years. So short-term volatility in terms of the conditions of the market might have some impact, but it's really not, uh, it's, it's really difficult to, to let's say, it, it is not such, such, a, such an impact for the long run. When you look at the, at, at the project on the long run, you need, need to look at the market for those timber products that you are putting into the, into the market and how you are actually accessing the market. So I would say that it's more important to see how you develop the value chain to get into the market and develop these new products with these non, very known species. It's more critical that than really the impact that you will have from the financial markets or the, the condition, because yes, there's an impact, but in the long run, it's less. Um, thank you all. So my question uh, is also for Alejandro. Um, so I was wondering, um, what are the biggest challenges in terms of uh, working with the local communities? Um, I guess, yeah, probably there are some social safeguards that you had to put in place. Uh, well, this is something uh, people talk a lot about when working with, uh, for example, carbon projects. I wonder if there's something different when uh, you work with timber-based models. Um, yeah, and how can you make sure that the distribution of the revenues and of power uh, between uh, the different um, individuals uh, of the local communities is fair? Uh, actually, you touch a very good, uh, a very good point. Uh, in our fund, first we, we look at the first sourcing. Uh, we we have a first sourcing policy, and we really look at at that aspect of of really is spreading up way uh, to all the different actors in the value chain, the the profit and the revenue generated. So, so for example, just to give you an example, we will look at having with the companies we are investing and we are working and partnering to have a fair sourcing policy in place and really actively putting it in, uh, you know, taking it from, from uh, following all the profits that are generated and really uh, spread that across the, all the value chain. The second point about challenges of working with communities, definitely it's, it's more challenging working with a community than when you work with an entrepreneur or a company already established in, in, in the wood market, let's say. And um, one of the main challenges we focus there, it is the governance. Uh, because most of these communities, uh, 
might have access to the forest, but they basically they are not owners of the forest. So the communities have have to really manage the governance and how they how they actually have the access and the rights to to, to the forest. To do that, first we start with really uh, following the guidelines of the FBIC. Really, uh, for every community, we look at the governance structure and be ensured that. Uh, the governance is in place to, be sh to, to ensure that every person in the community has access to the information and it's, it gives their content that they, they, are, they, they, they are part of the project. Second, we look at, at uh, working with the community in terms of that same governance structure to ensure that for the future, the, for, for the future of the project, that is maintained. So, for example, just to give you a more specific example, we have done an investment in an ejido in Mexico. Uh, and, and ejidos by itself, they have, they have uh, the right of, for the forest, but it's not their forest. And the ejido itself is divided in different areas. So when we look at the project, we ensure that the areas that are assigned to the project are actually the areas of the, perp the members of the HIDO who are participating in the project. And when we are looking at business plans and forecasting the business plans, we adapt that to that, to, 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 to that um, uh, ownership level, let's say, or access level. And we ensure that that is followed uh, according to the governance of the community. But definitely it's, it's challenging. And just to finalize, another uh, instrument that we put in place is basically a local, a local um, um, monitoring agent. So we, we contact local, uh, local experts in the area who have trust and know the community, because again, this, this is a lot about trust, and, and who will support them. It's not, it's not just going to, they're going to monitor what the project, how the project is going, but they are as well going to give them support and guidance and technical guidance to really help them to, to, to develop the, the project. Uh, if I may compliment that, Alejandro, I understand your question also to be dealing with benefit sharing mechanisms of the carbon money. Was that a right uh, read, reading of your question? Yeah, more or less, yeah. Well, I, I just wanted to point out because I find it so important that there's an, uh, a perverse incentive in uh, carbon money um, in this benefit sharing mechanisms because. Uh, they call it the angels and sinners syndrome. If you have been very bad for your forest in the past, you can now sequester a lot of carbon. So if you are rewarded for that carbon that would possibly partially also grow back naturally, uh, then you are, uh, yeah, sort of penalizing the punctual who have been very good with their forests. So in the benefit sharing me mechanisms where I've been involved in, in Papua New Guinea and, and other countries, uh, we do that in a very uh, participatory process with the, the local landowners, very much a, an FPIC uh, uh, compatible process, uh, whereby we look at all sorts of things, but a, a sort of a basic payment for an area, but then also top it up with rewards, how much effort does it cost you to let the forest grow back or conduct the, the management practices uh, to make it grow back. So there's a lot of literature on benefit sharing mechanism already dating back to the, the beginning of this, this century basically as soon as the, the, the Kyoto Protocol came into existence. So it, there's a lot of interesting literature on that if you are interested. Thank you. Great. Any other questions? I don't think so. Um, anything that you would like to add that you haven't said yet in that case? Because otherwise I think it's time for the welcome reception and I'm looking forward to continuing our chats uh, there. Thank you for joining everyone.